sharply at 3.30. Um, okay, so let me introduce, so, so Ben Finio came here in 2007, okay. uh, uh, from, from Bucknell, where he was a mechanical engineering student at Bucknell, um, and uh, let's see, he was, we have an NDSEG fellow, right? Yes. Okay. He is an NDSEG fellow, which is, which is um, prestigious, I think there's only about 100 of those every year, uh, given that across the country. It's pretty, it's, it's nice. Okay, so, uh, and, um, and, and so when Ben joined us, uh, he started working on um, topics related to what would become Rovies, what is now Rovies, uh, and in particular some of the design and control aspects. So, please take a look. All right, uh, could someone get the door in the back just so we don't get the noise from the hallway? All right. Okay, thanks. Um, and I guess in terms of questions, if you have a really pertinent one, um, feel free to interrupt me. I don't want anything to not be clear, but um, since we're on a time constraint, try and hold close up at the end, and then we'll fit them in. So today I'll be talking about my thesis work here at Harvard, Roll Pitch and the Auto Control for a Robotic Bee. Most of you are already familiar with the RoboB project, so the introduction is going to be pretty brief. The idea is that we want to have an autonomous swarm of insect-sized flapping wing robots that can do something like crop pollination. And this project is mostly at Harvard. We have some collaborators broken up into three separate teams. We call the body, brain, and colony teams. Most of the work I'm going to be talking about today focuses on the body team, which is how we're going to build this device, what it's going to be made out of, how we're going to actuate it, and how it's going to fly. If we have time at the end, I'd be happy to talk about the related areas of the brain team that's looking at onboard sensing electronics, and then the colony team, which is looking at swarm algorithms for interactions between hundreds or thousands of these vehicles. But most of what I'm going to focus on primarily, we're looking at a single unit with all off-board sensing electronics and just one vehicle, so not looking at interactions with other vehicles. The state of the art five years ago when I arrived at the lab, this is what Rob did when he set up the Harvard Micro Robotics Lab back in 2005-2006. Uh, we had a single vehicle that could flap its wings and lift off vertically on two guide wires that act like training wheels. So these constrain the orientation so it can't tip over and allow it to lift off without worrying about stability control since this vehicle actually had no mechanism to generate body torques and thus stabilize or maneuver. And you need these training wheels because if you remove them, you have something that can lift off, but it's an unstable system, so it will almost immediately crash. So we have this series of open loop lift off videos here where the training wheels are gone and it inverts and crashes way away. And my contribution has been taking this original design, adding the ability to control body torques, and thus enabling controlled flight. So I'm going to explain how we got from those early tests to this, where we can now, using closed loop feedback, there's a motion capture system off screen that you can't see. We can get the fly to lift off under controlled conditions, and now we're just limited by the length of this tether that's supplying power. So what I'm going to try to explain in the next 45 minutes is how we got from down here to up there and fill in this blank. I'm going to go through mechanical design of the vehicle itself, a dynamic model that can predict how it can generate these body torques, the infrastructure to actually measure the torques, and then finally synthesizing all of this information to do a controlled flight like we just saw in the last video. To put this a little more in context in terms of the state of the art, if we look at nature, we have a wide range of flapping wing animals, ranging from large birds down to small insects. And there have actually been a, several analogous robots developed mm -hmm. across all these size ranges. So some of the more notable recent ones, we have the Festo Smart Bird, the Air Environment Nano Hummingbird that I believe was just on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, the Delphi University Delphi Micro, and then finally the Harvard Robobee, as it's now called. But if you look at all these things to scale, trying to use the human hand in these different images for scale, you can see we are way down here in the sub-gram range, so orders of magnitude smaller than the next largest successful autonomous flying robot that's out there right now. So these larger ones have the advantage of being able to use off-the-shelf lithium-ion batteries, microprocessors, DC motors, other things that really aren't appropriate when you scale down this small. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is going to have a lot to do just with the engineering challenges that arise having a vehicle of this scale. So the first part of this I'm going to talk about is the mechanical design. Here it helps to have a cursory understanding of insect flight. I'm really not going to do this justice, so apologies mostly to Stacy because this is something people spend their entire uh, PhDs or careers studying. The basic idea, this is modeled after a deterrent insect, so flies, and the wings paddle back and forth as they flap. So normally when we first say flight, people think of birds flapping their wings up and down, where they generate lift and thrust on the downstroke and then tuck the wings in, extend them again, and flap down to generate lift and thrust and push themselves forward. And the deterrent insects flap back and forth and reverse the direction of the wing at the end of the stroke, so flap forward, flip the wing around, flap backward. That allows you to generate lift in both directions. And sorry, I'll move the mouse out of the middle of the screen. So think of this like if you were treading water and you couldn't use your legs, you would paddle your hands back and forth to sail off. 
Here we just have that same video from three different angles. From the top, you can see this flapping motion. From the side, you can see the wing twisting. And then from the front, you can see there's some vertical out-of-plane deviation, but in robotics, we typically ignore that because it simplifies the mechanism you need to flap if you're just flapping back and forth on a flat plane. So this is the basic mechanism for lift generation, but for my thesis, we're interested in how insects use these wings to steer. So this is a video that we took in our lab, but there's also a wealth of phylogical literature studying this. And this fly is tethered in front of a computer monitor that's off screen, so we can't see it. And that screen is going to have a small black dot that rapidly expands. The fly sees that as an imminent collision and attempts to steer away by drastically dropping the stroke amplitude of this wing on our right, keeping the amplitude of this wing constant, also maybe raising its legs to brace for an impact, and trying to steer away, but of course it's tethered, so in this case it can't. And if we look at the mechanism that's driving this internally, in deuterian insects, it's a distributed set of two distinct types of muscles called, in this case, if this is looking at a cross-section of half the thorax, we have indirect flight muscles, or power muscles, that are supplying the majority of the mechanical power for flight, so they're symmetrically flapping both wings, and then smaller sets of direct flight muscles, or control muscles, that are directly attached to the wings and can generate fine-tuned asymmetric motions, such as this amplitude asymmetry here that the fly would use to turn. So there are some other mechanisms. These videos are from Stacy's lab looking at bees flying in a gusty environment. They will actually extend their legs to increase their moment of inertia and slow down their rotation or shift their legs side to side to move their center of mass or change the aerodynamic drag profile. But we believe this mechanism is auxiliary and the primary mechanism for most deuterian insects. Uh, bees are actually of different orders of hymenoptera. Okay. Um, the primary mechanism for most of these insects is wing kinematics and not something secondary like leg motions. So, what I investigated first was the original device Rob built and how to use wings to steer this device. So this is a schematic of the original robot that has four components, each analogous to a component in the biological system. We have an airframe that is roughly the equivalent of a rigid exoskeleton, a central power actuator, like the power muscles that flaps the wings symmetrically. The actuator is a piezoelectric bimorph, so a piezoelectric beam with two piezoelectric plates when you apply an oscillating voltage signal to those plates. That beam moves, bends, the tip moves up and down, and then the tip of that beam is connected to a mechanical linkage or transmission system. So this video just shows a cartoon of that linkage. The actuator would be coming out of the board towards us, moving the central link up and down. And then the wings, which I cut off here just so we could zoom in on the mechanism, rotate around these two red points. And then here's two different videos showing this device in operation from two different angles. So here we have kind of a top-down view showing this mechanism moving up and down in this plane. And here's an isometric view showing going back into the board, you have this beam bending up and down, driving the mechanism. So if we zoom in again and look at this linkage system and how it's analogous to what's going on inside an insect thorax, we have a symmetric linkage, so it's the same on both sides, being driven by a central power actuator, and then there's these two pivot points where the wings are rotating, but those points are grounded, and there's no actuation at those points. If we look at a deuterian insect thorax, there's something like 18 to 20 pairs of control muscles that can individually actuate and fine-tune motions there, but we can't reproduce something on the scale and complexity of having 18 different actuators in there. So this is where my work really begins, was taking this design and just adding two actuators to those points. So we can move them back and forth and change the relationship or the transmission ratio between the central power actuator and the wing motion on each side. So this means taking the original design where we have this rigid airframe that extends all the way up to the wing pivot points, shortening that airframe down and adding two more actuators that are now connected to the pivot points of the wing. What that lets us do is have this same mechanism where the central point moves up and down, but now we can individually actuate the right and left wing pivot points either out of um, asynchronously or in phase with each other. So you can see we can move them independently, in phase, or 180 degrees out of phase. What this then allows us to do is control the wings in a manner such that we can directly control all three body torques. So here we have definition of the roll pitch and yaw axes. I'm going this may look kind of silly, but I find it easier just to act this out by waving my arms around. So pretend I'm a fly and I'm flapping my wings back and forth like this. And this is a top-down view of that flapping, so you see the extremes of the wing stroke highlighted. And then the X represents the center of lift averaged over one wing stroke. So looking at, again, biological literature and experiments with our robot, it turns out that for insects of about this size, the body dynamics are typically in order of magnitude slower than the wing beat dynamics, or in other words, it takes about 10 wing beats to execute a turn. So we only are worried about time average forces and torques as opposed to instantaneous forces and torques during the stroke. So we can modulate a time average parameter to control these torques to steer. First, for pitch, all we have to do is shift the stroke forward or backward. This actually doesn't require separate actuators. You can do this with a single actuator. So if I'm flapping 
not only symmetrically front to back, but dorsal ventrally and bilaterally, meaning left to right, that lift force is going to go directly through my center of mass and there's no net torque. That's what you see over here. If I just shift that flapping forward, that will move the lift force forward of my center of mass and cause a pitch back torque, or vice versa, move that flapping backward, that will cause pitch forward. For roll, we can use differential amplitude. This is what you saw in that video of the fly, where again, I'm flapping symmetrically. I increase the amplitude of the wing on this side, that increases the lift force here. Decrease the amplitude of the wing here, the lift goes down, that will cause me to roll in this direction. And then finally for yaw, this is a little more complicated. You have to use what we call split cycle flapping. So this is a paddling motion where I'm not coordinated enough to do this with both arms at once, so I'll do it with one. You flap forward rapidly and then backwards slowly, so that paddles you around in the yaw direction, and then you do the opposite for the other wing, where you paddle backward quickly and then forward slowly, so you get a net contribution to yaw torque from each wing during the stroke. Another big part of this, I'm not actually going to have a lot of time to talk about, is the fabrication. How are we actually going to build one of these devices and put it together? And this would be a good time to pass around some of the props. So, the basic idea is that we laser machine individual components and hand assemble them under a microscope. This is really not the best way to do it because it's a very skill intensive process. So, if you're interested in hearing more about how we used to build these things, how we build them now, and how hopefully we're going to build them in the future, I see Prathee's not here, but many of you know Prathee in my lab. Um, his thesis defense is going to talk all about this, so free plug for him. In the meantime, I'm going to pass around um, the sample tray of parts and then a completed vehicle. Probably well, didn't steal this one yet, you get one at the end. Um, I guess if those wind up at the back, maybe just leave them on a the table somewhere or get them back up to the front. So I have several prototypes that I made over the years as this process has improved, they've improved in quality, and that's enabled us to use them for the torque characterization experiments and then the free flight control experiments that I'll be talking about towards the end. So it's nice that we have this conceptual idea that I can flap the wings around in a certain way to generate certain torques, but that really doesn't give us a number in terms of the magnitude of these torques and if they're actually going to be useful for a vehicle of this size. So this is where we want to use a physics-based dynamic model coupled with an aerodynamic model to predict the magnitude of the torques and see if they're sufficient to steer. So we can go back to this wing transmission actuator system and use an Euler-Lagrange formulation or Newton's method or whatever you want to do to look at this system dynamically and say, okay, we have an inertial and aerodynamic load of the wings being driven by a force source from the piezoelectric actuator. <coughs> There's an elastic component due to this elastic beam use an on the ground formulation and get some big messy differential equation that you can solve numerically. I'm not going to work through those details now, but to get to the point of the simulation is you can use it to calculate an interesting aerodynamic parameter such as the stroke amplitude differential. So I'm just going to use roll torque as an example here. We want to know the difference between the amplitude of the left and right wings because that's going to lead to a roll torque. So this is a simulation showing that stroke amplitude differential, so this angle minus that one, against flapping frequency and then the uh, position of that control actuator. So we have two actuators but if we lock them to move 180 degrees out of phase with each other, there's only one position you need to worry about, and get a nice linear response um, for the stroke amplitude differential. I also did some early on experiments. Not This was, again, ties back into fabrication and the quality of devices we could build several years ago when I started out. Clearly, this attached to a big plastic block was not intended to fly. It's just a mechanism to test out this actuator transmission system to see if we could actuate stroke amplitude differential. That worked very well in the first try, so we can actually see um, stroke amplitude differential changes at about the same range of tens of degrees for this actuation mechanism. And again, tying back into fabrication, notice how this is asymmetric. The simulation is nice and symmetric about zero, whereas the experiment is kind of biased in one direction. So again, plug for phase thesis. Now, we're not actually interested in the wind kinematics. What we ultimately want to know is the torque, which is what's going to control the vehicle. So you can feed this into an aerodynamic model, which again, I don't really have time to talk about, but I believe Peter, who's in here somewhere, will address at his defense if you're interested in that. And we can calculate a torque on the order of a micro-newton meter or a millinewton meter for this amplitude differential, which intuitively at first I didn't have a lot of sense for what that magnitude meant. If you convert the units to 100 milligram millimeters for a vehicle that weighs about 100 milligrams and has wings on the length scale of millimeters, this seems to make sense, but I'll come back to this a little later when we actually get to the torque measurements. Now, another interesting aspect of the dynamic model is predicting the resonant frequency. So for the deterrent insects, and for this robot, we want to flap at resonance to minimize our unnecessary power expenditure. So you can use a lump parameter model where we have an actuator with an internal inertial damping and spring load being driven by a force source that drives the inertial and damping load of the wing through a transmission. And each one of these components can be nonlinear. So there can be hysteresis in the actuator, there's geometric nonlinearities in the transmission, there's nonlinear aerodynamic forces. And this is a chapter of my thesis, so I don't have time to go through the derivation now. We can do that in the questioning at the end if we have time. 
Turns out it can all boil down to a single degree of freedom linearized spring mass damper system, and you can use that to predict the resonant frequency. This is something Rob did as a back of the envelope calculation for the initial system five years ago. But we didn't have a lot of experimental data to actually compare this model to. So thanks to um, some new experiments we had set up and my colleague Nestor, who's in here somewhere, uh, we have full <coughs> frequency domain information about the fly's performance. So this is a Bode plot showing normalized stroke amplitude against the flapping frequency using a high order 48 thumb order fit and then a lower order fourth order model fit just to model these first two resonant peaks because at higher frequencies the dynamics tend to get contaminated by the experimental apparatus itself as opposed to the actual dynamics of the fly. So what we're really interested in is predicting this first resonant peak for the physics-based model to see if then if we scale the vehicle up or down, see if the RoboB project where we're interested in maybe a 500 milligram vehicle instead of the 100 milligram vehicle we're working with now, you need to use this model to see if you can predict the resonant frequency because a different size vehicle will have a different size actuator, different size wings, and thus a different, fra different flapping frequency. You want to be able to predict that frequency correctly if you scale the vehicle up or down. And it turned out that the linearized model actually works very well for predicting resonant frequency, in this case, around 100 hertz. So it's nice that we have this conceptual idea that we can move the wings to flap in a certain way. We have a dynamic model that predicts, OK, and some preliminary experiments that looks like, OK, we can actually generate these wing kinematic asymmetries that should lead to a torque. But when I did this early on, we didn't actually have the ability to directly measure those torques. And this was because you immediately run into a problem when you try to measure torques on something this size, that for a larger vehicle or a larger robot, a torque sensor is something you just go buy. So there are fully packaged data acquisition systems where you have a nice six axis load cell with some machined holes on the interface. You bolt those onto your robot. These are used all the time in robotic manipulation where you want to measure end effector forces. This goes through some signal conditioning electronics into software to measure the readout. And if you look at the specs for the smallest one of these devices we could find, so say the ATI Nano 17 shown here next to the tip of a pencil, the resolution is about five micronewton meters. So this is already larger than the maximum torques we're predicting from the vehicle, so we're below the available resolution for the smallest commercially available sensor. This means we need to build something new, and if you do a rough calculation and say we want equivalent performance in terms of the number of divisions you get over the range, we need something with at least a factor of 500 better resolution, even if we're very lenient about the range for the lower piece, and we need something 100 times bigger than what we're actually predicting. So this means we have to build our own. This came from excuse me, some work Rob did a few years ago to develop a uh, force sensor for the same reason. So the idea is you take a small elastic beam with a target plate that forms one end of the capacitor, align that with the sensor head of the capacitor probe, then we apply a load to the beam this capacitor moves, the gap distance changes, and you can calibrate it such that the change in that capacitance goes through signal conditioner and corresponds to the load applied to the beam. So I took this and applied the same concept to a torque sensor. So now we have an elastic beam with a different cross-sectional geometry. So this is a plus-shaped cross-section, meaning it's very stiff to axial and transverse forces, but very compliant to torque in this direction, and also very stiff to torques in the other two directions. So you have this elastic beam with a target plate sticking out, you apply torque to that beam, the target plate will move with respect to this capacitive probe, and you can measure that change and calibrate it to correspond to the torque. And you can run this through a geometric optimization, in this case to fit uh, specifically for a 100 milligram probe beam and the torques we expect from that vehicle, and wound up with something with a resolution of about 5 nanonewton meters, so a thousand times better than the Nano 17. But again, it's only single axis, not multi-axis, I'll come back to that a little later. So with this sensor now enables, uh, sorry, we built this in-house and we passed this around as well. Um, using the same techniques, techniques we built to use the robot, we laser machine a flat steel sheet and we get all these individual parts, assemble them in three dimensions and laser mold them together to get the final product. So we we'll pass that around. Um, develop a support structure to align these capacitive probes. Uh, Kevin Galloway helped out a lot with this. I don't think he's here, but I wanted to give him a thank you and mount the fly to the front of the sensor using a lightweight carbon fiber truss structure. Unfortunately, since it's a single axis sensor, we have to reorient the fly to measure each torque. So here it's shown in the orientation to measure pitch, which is this direction, and then we have to rotate it 90 degrees to measure roller yaw. So this video is going to show a top-down view of this setup. So we're looking down on the fly flapping, rotated 90 degrees from this orientation to measure roll torques, and we're going to use the control actuators to pump the wing amplitude up and down at first symmetrically, which would control lift force, and then asymmetrically, which is going to generate roll torques. So again, here's the top-down video. This is real-time, so the wing is just going to look like a blur, but you can see the envelope flapping. 
So there's the wing amplitude pumping up and down symmetrically. Again, that would increase and decrease lift, but not generator torque. And then if we do this 180 degrees out of phase, you'll see the amplitude of one wing go up while the amplitude of the other wing goes down. That oscillates and generates a roll torque. So what this now allows us to do is open loop system characterization where we're feeding in a control voltage to the rotor beam. This is a different voltage for either the roll pitch or yaw torque. So I can go into the details of that and how it drives the actuators uh, later. I'm not going to go into that now. This creates a physical torque, which is measured by the torque sensor, the torque sensor capacitor probe output an analog voltage, which goes through a calibration, gives us the instantaneous torque, but we can filter that and calculate the average torque. So we just package this whole thing and call our system control voltage in, average torque out. And this allows me to just sweep through that voltage and measure the torque value for each of these orientations. So I did this for roll pitch and yaw. I'm starting with pitch. Remember, this is shifting the stroke, flapping forward or backward. And actually got a nice linear response on the order of plus or minus one micro Newton meters. So going back to the dynamic model, this is the same order of what was predicted by the dynamic model. Similar results for roll using differential stroke amplitude. And we have a different control voltage, but a similar magnitude range of the torque. And same for yaw using the split cycle flapping parameter, we get a torque range of about a micro-newton meter. So even though you can convert the units and kind of have an intuitive sense that this seems right for a vehicle of this size, we still weren't really sure if this is actually going to be appropriate, so thought it would be helpful to compare to biological data from other insects, as well as other robots if we could find the data. So this plot is showing the magnitude of torques measured during steering maneuvers against body mass for several different insects, the robo-bee, and then the air environment now. <coughs> And while there are some caveats about this that I can discuss later, it's not intended to say the row is definitely controllable because it seems to fall in the appropriate range. Given no intuition about the magnitude of the torque, it does tell us at least, okay, we don't have fruit fly sized torques on a hawk moth sized vehicle. We don't have to completely go back to the drawing board here. The design is probably appropriate. So I mentioned these are only single axis sensors, so we can't measure coupling at all. So I've been pretending, kind of glossing over the fact so far that there could be coupling between each of these degrees of freedom. For example, when I actuate roll torque and change amplitude asymmetrically. Since the transmission is not linear, that can also cause a small shift in the forward or backward stroke bias, and that can couple into a pitch torque. Same thing could happen from any of the torques to lift. You don't want to, say, respond to a roll perturbation by actuating roll torque, but then fall out of the sky because your lift value drops by 25%. You want to have those things reasonably decoupled, and you can't characterize that all with, at all with a single axis sensor. So I developed a two axis sensor which uses a similar concept. We have an elastic beam with target plates, and the deflection of those plates is measured by a capacitor probe, except this beam is now also very compliant to a force in this direction, in addition to a torque about this axis. So we can measure two outputs, one uh, lift force and then one torque. We went through a similar process where we designed this test apparatus to support the capacitor probes, mount the fly-on with a lightweight carbon fiber beam. And what this now allows is multi-input, multi-output system characterization. So now we have <clears throat> excuse me, two inputs to the system, a voltage to the power actuator that's defining the lift force, and a voltage to the control actuators that's defining one of the torques, or in the case of pitch, both of these voltages are actually the power actuator. And now we have a two by two system where we measure lift and torque. We have two voltages that go through a two by two calibration, and then a filter that gives us average lift and average torque. We package all of these into one two by two system, and this enables open and closed loop system identification and control. So this is work done by a colleague Nestor, who's a postdoc in the lab with more of a background in control theory, to identify this two by two system. So this grid is showing voting plots or frequency domain behavior for lift and roll, where we have two inputs, a lift voltage and a roll voltage, and then two outputs, average lift force and average lift torque. So we want these diagonal terms, or lift input to lift output, and roll input to roll output, to be very high, and we want the off diagonal terms to be low, so we don't want coupling. And if you look at these off-diagonal terms in the open-loop system, you can see we do have some coupling because you can tell the magnitude of these off-diagonal terms isn't very small. It's of the comparable magnitude to the diagonal terms. So you can design a closed-loop controller. Sure. Sorry, uh, is this coupling between the physical system or coupling between the axes and the force sensor? We don't know for sure. Some of it is definitely due to the force sensor. So there's definitely a contribution from the force to the torque. I don't know. We can characterize that definitely based on how the sensor works, right? If you just have a fly mounted radially offset from the axis of rotation, then you'll have coupling from force to torque. I don't think you can figure out the inverse. So the, the roll to lift coupling could be real. You can characterize statically the coupling <coughs> force sensor during the calibration procedure. Right. But that, that, no, the 2x2 two two game matrix takes care of that. This is, 
when you can't separate out what's actually going on when the fly's flapping. Um, I, I can work out the math later, I don't think we have time for it now. But the short answer, the I believe the lift to roll torque coupling is mostly due to the sensor, but I'm, we're not sure about this one. Okay. Okay. So we can do closed loop control where we now feed back this average force of torque to follow a reference trajectory and design a controller. Again, this is Nestor's work to design a controller that minimizes these off diagonal turns. So go back and compare the open and closed loop system. Here we have the same plots with the original open loop system in blue and then the closed loop system in green. And you can see we can dramatically drop the magnitude of these off diagonal turns while keeping the magnitude of the diagonal turns the same. This allows us to do decoupled lift force and roll torque control. So this plot is just showing a time series of lift and roll where the black is the reference trajectory and the red is the measured amount from the torque sensor. And we can do this at different frequencies showing that the two, the force and the torque are very decoupled thanks to the controller design. So the development of the torque sensor enabled this since otherwise we wouldn't have been able to measure these parameters. Now to move on to the most exciting part, which I'll save for last, of course. Actually synthesizing all of this information to do flight control. So for starters, this was modeled after work done by some of my other colleagues in the lab. Um, Nestor, Kevin Ma, Kevin Galloway, Jack, Rob, and um, I guess Pat Palm wasn't on this one. But to do single degree of freedom altitude control. So we put the training wheels back on, and this makes the control problem easier because we're only controlling one degree of freedom. So you're going up and down the wires, but your orientation is restricted because you have these training wheels, and we can close the loop with a laser displacement sensor to measure the altitude, feed that back, and control the elevation of the fly, either by changing the flapping frequency or the flapping amplitude. We wanted to do something similar for a rotation. So it took this concept and modified the original fly to thread a wire approximately through the center of mass. This allows you to rotate in a pitch direction, but constrains all other degrees of freedom. Put this in a motion capture environment, so there are cameras surrounding the fly that track the position of retroreflective markers on the airframe. Feedback now the pitch orientation. So whereas before we had the robo being mounted on a torque sensor and we're measuring this torque value, we now have a feedback loop where the robo is free to move. So there's rigid body dynamics, but this original system that we characterized is the same. So we still have the control voltage going into the robo B and a torque coming out. And we have the rigid body dynamics now, but we know that since the rigid body dynamics are affected by the average torque, not the instantaneous torque, even though we're removing the torque sensor, calibration, and filter from this system, this characterization is still useful in terms of designing the controller. So this is work done primarily by Nestor and uh, Pat Kong, who's another grad student in the lab, to just control pitch attitudes. So again, here's a similar plot showing a reference trajectory of pitch versus time, and then the measured amount in blue, and then a series of screenshots from high-speed video and the motion capture shop software showing the fly pitch. And apologies if I switch back and forth between fly and beat. It depends on who's finding it. Uh, as it pitches backward and then forward again. So next we wanted to move to unconstrained free flight experiments. This is kind of the holy grail, the ultimate goal. And this requires a vehicle that can actually get off the ground. So in those pitch experiments, we have wire going through the center of mass that's holding the vehicle up in the air. If we want to be able to get up in the air steer, we need to get up in the air first. <coughs> I showed those videos back at the beginning of in the original RoboBee design about the extra actuators, lifting off without much trouble. So when I took my design off the sensor, put it on the ground, and hoped it would lift off, I got a lot of pathetic twitching and not a lot of exciting liftoff. Um, the one good thing we learned from this series of tests is that the wings are surprisingly resilient to being bashed against the ground, but that was about it. So a series of tests, tweaking parameters, trying higher amplitudes, <coughs> higher frequencies to see if it would actually get in the air. Got some misleading, uh, promising but misleading results. For example, here we get a lucky bounce off one wing and then it looks like it goes into forward flight, kind of exit stays right, but um, really it was just because of that lucky bounce. And if we play this in reverse, it looks like we're doing a controlled landing, but I decided not to cheat and do that. <laughs> so ultimately it looked like this vehicle was too heavy to get off the ground. So I went back and looked at the mass budget compared to the original robo B, where we have a 60 milligram vehicle, so very light, and about two thirds of that is the power actuator. So the piezoelectric material is very heavy, the supporting structure, the airframe, the wings, it's mostly carbon fiber, so that's all very light. So adding in two unnecessarily large piezoelectric actuators, because I wasn't sure if the torque mechanism was actually going to work, didn't really work that well because their mass is enormous. So I have a 40 milligram power actuator and two control actuators at 20 milligrams each. The thing could barely go off the ground because we had nearly doubled its weight, some of the other components getting a little heavier and beefier too. So it went back and somewhat dramatically slimmed it down. Um, I'm going to pass around let's see, a couple different prototypes. For comparison here, I have the original somewhat beefy design and then the much slimmer design. Um, so most notably, look at the airframe and then how much smaller the two actuators on the sides are. 
And this shaved the weight about 25% off this one down to about 83 milligrams. And this had no trouble lifting off. So this is the first open loop lift off video where I actually got even better performance than the original row would be without the extra actuator since it actually flew off the top of the screen before it managed to crash. And now having this mechanism that can lift off with the control actuators for generating body torques, that enabled the first series of open loop steering tests. So this might get a little confusing since I have four videos playing at once. If you just look at the top, we have the fly starting in the same location and just executing roll left and roll right commands. So no feedback control, just sending an open loop, lock the control actuators in one position, tell it to roll in a certain direction. So you see it start in the same place in the left and right videos, roll to either side, and then the bottom is pitch forward and pitch back. So again, the fly is starting in the same location. The video on the left is pitching back into the screen away from us, and then the one on the right is pitching toward us. But you'll notice these aren't perfectly decoupled. So if they were perfectly decoupled, the top videos would show the fly moving exactly right and left, and the bottom video would show it moving directly forward and backward. You can see a little pitching in the roll videos, a little rolling in the pitch videos, and maybe a little yaw in all four. So again, this ties back into fabrication yet again. This is variable from fly to fly. So in SolidWorks or in the CAD files, the fly is perfectly symmetric. You laser cut them, but then wind up hand assembling under a microscope. That it can introduce asymmetries that are very highly variable. So one prototype can tend to pitch forward, one can tend to yaw to the left, one can tend to roll backwards. The hope is that we can build them well enough that the controller can then compensate for whatever bias there is and we can eliminate an inherent bias when we do the free flight controlled experiments. So moving on to controlled flight tests, and this everything from now on I'll talk about was worked on with Nestor. I did all the open loop stuff and then we worked together to do the closed loop control. So similar architecture to the pitch control experiments, but we are now feeding for um, six, sorry, we now have six forces and torques, so three forces, three torques, and then six degrees of freedom motion, we feed that back through the motion capture system that's capturing the location of these retroreflected markers. But for the initial experiments, we only fed back the pitch and roll angles. So since we didn't actually have a um, six-axis sensor to characterize all three forces and all three torques, but we had characterized very well pitch and roll, we just set the goal of doing a controlled vertical liftoff. So we're not controlling altitude, in which case we would try to lift off to a certain location and remain there. We're just trying to control tip and tilt or pitch and roll attitude as we ascend in a vertical line. And since we didn't have a two-axis torque sensor, we actually didn't know anything about pitch roll coupling. We knew about pitch lift coupling and roll lift coupling. We just ran separate PID loops for pitch and roll, hoping they were reasonably decoupled enough that the controller could compensate for this. And at first, this did not go very well. Um, you're going to see we went through dozens of experiments here, so the test number will be indicated in the upper left. I think we actually had a sign convention for pitch wrong here, so it's not as bad as it looks. Uh, once we fix that, we started getting better results, but still having the system go unstable or crash eventually. So here we get you know, higher altitude liftoff, and we still go unstable on pitch. And there's going to be a frame rate jump in the next videos. These are shot at 100. The next videos are shot at 500 frames per second. So it's going to look a little slower. Started getting some results where we could see the controller working. So here we have a fly roll to the left. And then you can see the controller correct and roll it back to the right, but it overcorrects and crashes. And once we're inverted 180 degrees, the motion capture system has lost the vehicle, so the controller is no longer doing anything useful since it's not getting good information. And kept iterating through this. You can see we're all the way up to test 78 now, where we were able to correct, compensate, and then compensate again instead of just overcompensating and crashing. So there you see a very initial roll to the left, roll to the right again, and then kind of back here. I'll play that again because you can definitely see an interaction with the wire. That's a question we get very commonly. So if you look as it gets towards the top of the flight, there's a little loop in the wire that unravels and causes the fly to do a 360. And then typically when we reach the end of the wire, the wire going taut provides an impulse that destabilizes the fly and causes it to come crashing back down. So after dozens and dozens and dozens of trials, we're all the way up here at test 92. This is the one I showed at the beginning. We were finally able to get controlled liftoff with a very nice vertical trajectory where we are now just limited by the length of this tether, nudge, nudge, brain team. So we have the wire go taut, provide this impulse, and come crashing down, but can still survive falls from a pretty high altitude. So this fly survived about 100 trials before it finally broke. So since we're doing this in a motion capture environment, I can track the trajectory for each one of these to compare them and compare the performance to the controller. So here we have these five representative trajectories from several different viewpoints, three top, uh, front, and side views. And you can really see the huge difference between that initial red trajectory that's pretty much just a face plant, and then the final blue one where we get this very nice straight liftoff until there's a little kink at the top and the wire goes tight. 
remember that we're only controlling pitch and roll attitude, not lateral position. So I believe this is the front view. This drift off to the right is probably explained by the wire pulling in that direction since we're not actually trying to correct and stay at the same X location. But if you look at the pitch and roll attitude during all these flights and compare them so that final blue one is highlighted with a thicker line here and compared to the other ones, remember we're not controlling y'all, just pitch and roll. But you can definitely see, for example, that first red test just goes right off the pitch right away to over 90 degrees. And then you see a lot of oscillations in roll for the other trials, but the blue one really stays flat for both until we get to the very end and the wire goes taut. So this is preliminary since our ultimate goal is obviously to have the vehicle fly around controlling all degrees of freedom and our short-term goal is make stable hover, so closing the loop on altitude as well. But I hope I managed to explain how we got from here to up there. Of course, there's a very long way to go from getting here to all the way out there. This depends on contributions from many other people, not just myself, or we use this huge project. And a lot of what I talked about today wouldn't be possible without contributions from a lot of other people, and especially, excuse me, Rob starting the project initially. So I have a lot of people to thank. Um, first and foremost, Rob Wood for admitting me to the lab five years ago in its formative years. I'm not sure if I would get in now. It's gotten pretty competitive. Um, <laughs> my committee, um, Professor Combs, Professor Walsh, Professor Mahanavan, for all your feedback and taking the time to meet with me, and my unofficial committee members, uh, Professor Brockett and Veronica. Um, everyone in the microbiotics lab, whether you work on robots or not, I couldn't have done this without you guys, either socially or academically. My girlfriend, Erin, who hopefully you all believe exists now, she's sitting right over there. Uh, all my friends from Bucknell, you know, where the engineering thing started, definitely could have done it without you guys. And most of all, mom and dad, I couldn't have done this without your support for the last 25 years from day one when we made it to where I am now. So, thank you. So the way that we, the way that this will work is uh, we'll open it up to questions from anybody in the audience, committee members included. Um, once we've exhausted uh, questions from the audience, we'll ask the audience to leave, and then the committee members will grill Ben, and then we'll ask Ben to leave. Uh, just a follow up to my earlier question. So when you had it mounted on the, was it lift roll? Or <coughs> lift, lift, lift roll. So you had it mounted on a lift roll sensor, and you did system ID. And you weren't able to differentiate between coupling in the sensor versus coupling in the device. Um, that's only true for one of the coupling terms. <coughs> what did you say? That, that's only true for one of the coupling terms. So we, we definitely could differentiate. We, we had lift to roll coupling figured out. And it, it could, there was a separate kind of pre processing step in the controller to get rid of that so we knew we were controlling the actual roll torque. Right. What we don't know is if changing, so again, if everything's perfectly symmetric, right, changing lift shouldn't affect roll torque at all, right? But if you have a gimpy wing where if you pump the amplitude up and down, that's also generating a torque, I don't think this setup could characterize that appropriately. So, so my question was, in any experiments afterwards, like, for example, in the pitch experiments or in any of the free flight experiments, were you able to look at that question further by either observation or by the system ID in subsequent experiments so then go back and answer that question? We probably could, but we have not. So that's, if we're going to talk about things that we could do, we now have a massive volume, you know, up to 100 trials of flight data where we were recording the inputs and then we have the Vicon data. So if we wanted to do some sort of system identification to characterize that, the, the data's there. I think the, I, approach is going to be more difficult since you don't have a controlled experiment where you're controlling the input and you can measure the output in real time, which is what Nestor did for all the other system ID. Now we have all these trials where we know nothing about the disturbances, so there's the wire and you know ambient air currents in that room that aren't going to be part of that data set. So we could try, but I don't know how much I would trust the results. So in the, in the last year, you were showing 100 trials of this sort of unconstrained flight, right? Again, this that's where really just it. turns into a giant plug for Pathes thesis. After that one broke, I built six more flies and not a board. <coughs> so they all had such a large inherent asymmetry from the manual assembly that the controller couldn't compensate for it at all. And what we found 
that we, the few tests we did get out of them before the new ones broke, the old controller didn't work. So even from individual trials with that fly crashing, something could get jostled that the dynamics would change slightly. So it seemed very sensitive to the game with just a simple PID controller. But that's so. the difference between all the tests. It's really the game. Yeah, just, just tuning the PID games. So we started with just proportional and then adding a little bit later. And yeah, we, we would hope that you could get to a set of games and then you could pump out identical flies and just plug them in and use the same controller, but that wasn't the case. Cool. There was also other issues like the, using the motion capture system instead of an onboard sensor. That's remarkably sensitive to thermal changes in the room. So we have a dozen computers running. Um, it cools down overnight, heats up in the morning. You can come back in and the controller that was working last evening is no longer working this morning because the motion capture is <coughs> So then there are a lot of other variables um, that prevented it from arriving at, okay, we now have a fixed controller that will work on all beats. We can definitely not make that claim. You think that fixing the manufacturing process will be fun to fix that? that that's, a, that's huge. So right, right now, building these things, I mean, pretty much everybody in the microbiome lab can vouch for this. It takes years to get good at. So, you know, for, for years, Rob was the only one who could build flight ready vehicles. It took me five years to get good enough at it. Um, we, we can't have a learning curve that long. So. Um, uh, you've seen Prithee's pop-up video, right? Yeah, so ha having an automated process that can produce repeatable bees is going to be huge. Yeah. On, a, on a related note, is the, it seemed like the, with the slimmed down design, but then there was a, like maybe some extra um, cargo capacity to add larger actuators. Mm -hmm. So like, it, would it be possible to add in larger actuators to compensate for some of the um, yeah, let me go back to, um, yeah, so that's something where th there is room for optimization or iteration there. You know, I only did two designs. So initially, again, not knowing, let me get back to it, there we go. Not knowing if this was going to work at all, I severely oversized the control actuators because it turns out, um, let me go actually way back to the beginning. So roughly, um, we have this plot of stroke amplitude differential, which leads to a roll torque. So this stroke amplitude differential is proportional to this displacement, and that displacement is proportional to how long the actuator is. So a longer actuator gives you a bigger amplitude, which then gives you a bigger torque. And I initially way oversized it, but it was too heavy, so just cut in half to see if it would work, not knowing if then the torques would be too small, um, and it worked. So, yeah, and there's also some, this also ties into not just what offsets you need to compensate for, but how maneuverable do you want the vehicle to be. So th this is something we haven't really defined yet, but you know, bigger torque makes you, means you can turn faster, but smaller torque means lighter actuators and longer flight time probably. So there's a trade-off there that we, have, we haven't defined yet. Um, so I like that on controls, but just because you're mentioning anomaly areas throughout the system. Mm -hmm. You said that you showed mathematically that you could simplify it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is, that, is that the case in the observations of actual tests? Uh, did you confirm that? So that's what the, the system identification test, like all, all the horde of bony plots <laughs> right. I've showed are fitting a linear system to the anomaly one. So you, you, and Nestor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you can capture the behavior of the nonlinear system using a higher order linear system and design a controller to compensate for those behaviors anyway. But from the, the experiments I did, for example, all of these open loop measurements, it, it looks like it's just a linear gain from a voltage input to a torque output. So even though you know we have this, oops, um, we have this system with all this potential nonlinear stuff in between, if Ultimately, your input-output relationship is linear, then I believe that works better. You don't have to, but th th I guess this also isn't true for some. Did any of the tests you did use nonlinear controllers, Nestor, or was everything linear? Like pitch control, altitude control, pitch force. Was any of the adaptive stuff nonlinear? Yeah, that things are nonlinear. But yeah, for everything we saw in the flight control, we didn't really try to compensate for anything. What do you think the efficiency is of the piezoelectric actuator? Terrible. Um, so when you have to put the power on board, you might have to 
change ideas altogether. So predictive flight times right now, given existing battery technology, are, to be blunt, visible. I think it's something like 15 seconds of flight time. Is that Carlson are doing here? Yeah, thereabouts. Okay. Um, and I guess if you extrapolate battery technology out five or 10 years and hope things get much better, um, and then make some other assumptions about improvements in the weight, improvements in aerodynamic efficiency, that flight time goes up to the order of minutes, which is still bad compared to insects of the same size. So I've, I've gotten into a lengthy discussion about a biologist with this in, uh, in terms of defining flight time for insects and then using that as a metric to compare to a vehicle of this mass. His answer was that you can define the flight time of an insect to be whatever you want because on one end of the spectrum, a starving animal will start metabolizing its own tissue and be able to go for a very long time. On the other end, um, you know, you go anaerobic and burn out and get tired really quickly. Flies don't actually fly around until they literally run out of fuel like we could do with a vehicle that the battery is going to drain. So you can come up with a huge spectrum from one end to the other of what the flight time for a comparably sized insect is. I think our goal, at least for most of our funding agencies, is they want something on the order of minutes up to 10 minutes. And right now, no, that's not realistic. But in terms of actuation technology, piezos are still the most viable thing for something this scale. But Ben, can, can you get more complicated for Professor Brockett's answer? So, our question. So, uh, what is the efficiency of the actuators? I believe that electromechanical efficiency is single digit percent. Thank you. And how does that compare to other alternative technologies? Which I mean, for because? larger DC motors, it's much higher, right? Tens, twenties. Sure, much for, for, this scale. for this scale, DC motors are just as bad, if not worse. Okay. Well, about uh, electrostatic actuation could be 99% efficient. Could be. Yeah. I, I think that this is really the, the result kind of was taken for a given when I arrived, to be honest. I never looked through actuator technology. But there's, true, a smaller scale, so <coughs> MEMS. Actuation, you have electrostatic comb drives, that sort of thing. The problem there is that the MEMS fabrication processes don't scale up to insect size. So this is a, a plot I don't have that Rob always shows, where you have MEMS on one end, macro scale, DC motors on the other end, and then in between more at this insect size scale. So the MEMS technologies don't scale up appropriately, the DC motors don't scale down, and we're left in the middle. But and this, uh, the other huge downside of the piezoelectric actuators that we usually get questions on is the voltage requirements. So these are Two to three hundred volts to drive, which requires a high voltage amplification circuit that then detracts from your payload. So, if you can get a lower voltage actuator with equivalent force and displacement output, that's the other big thing. You need a high force output to drive the wing flapping and the amp. These piezo beams are high force, low displacement. You amplify that low displacement through a transmission to get the large stroke amplitude. Not, then uh, this is a good time to ask everybody other than the committee to step outside. I'll ask you also to please stop filming.